Why do we want to go there anyway? Fish. Hanging out. Birds, use. I'll let you click through these things. Solitude. This is, it's all you. And all yourself. It's absolutely no fun. Two bass at a time. Those are a pair of three pounders. <laughs> Scenery just unparalleled anywhere, anywhere else. I mean, it's a unique, totally unique ecosystem. <clears throat> you're running into wells while you're, I mean, you know. I wasn't there that time of year. There's oh. camp, by the way. There's camp. Kitchen. Kitchen's actually here. Dining room. And we all had our own tents in the same. You got to burn your toilet paper to the coyotes. Bury it and burn it. <clears throat> There's a knockoff Starbucks down there. You can see the estuaries can get really tiny. You can get in there and you have it all to yourself. We caught some snook out of there. See, those, those were the halibut that came out of that hole. Gary with the cigar hanging out of his mouth. If you go onto his website and look up that trip from this year, there's actually some film footage shot by one of the Canadians of this all going on. It's pretty funny. And our cook. Those are some of the flies, if you can see them. Chartreuse. They all look like they're chartreuse over white. Yeah. Wave the weight on the clusters all the way forward for jigging action. Diving at the bottom, which crabs do. That was the average size halibut. Average. <laughs> Doormats. Two at a time. Two at a time on surfworms. 20 pound test, straight tippets of the dropper. Hike in the dunes. That was the turtle patrol. Another good thumbs up. They're actually patrolling to make sure they don't poach the turtle eggs. That's his job, is to patrol the beach. And there was, that was the hole. That was it. Huh. Almost out There's a uh, pargo, striped pargo. That's that. You remember that shrimp pattern, the, the blue shrimp? That thing was just absolutely lethal. That's a tube fly, by the way. You can ride the hook up or down. <clears throat> and there's the weed guard on the front of it, 40 pound fluorocarbon to make sure it goes over the top of the branches when you flip in there. It's five bay bass. Fish we couldn't even name. No fun at all. Absolutely no fun to go down there. There's nothing to see. <laughs> The, the paddle the stuck in the sand. Okay. Not my paddle, but <laughs> I had an anchor. I brought an anchor, so I was all set there. I wanted to ask you about the kayaks. If you're like if you're fishing here, not down there, and you have your own, you're buying your own, or you're borrowing your own, whatever you're doing, what do you recommend for fishing, and how do you rig it so you're not all caught up with lines and hooks and you know trying to get the fish in and all that. I, I, I really enjoy fishing in our kayak, but it's not even real fun, you know, as far as... We'll have to talk. We actually did a seminar on that, and there's also on the Fly Flicker website, if you look that up in the search engine... What read, website? Fly Flicker, F-L-I-F-L-I-C-K-R. Get it from me after, this, after the presentation. There's all kinds of advice and pictures on how to rig a kayak. Fishing. And there's lots of different ways to do are it. Are these all inflatable? Or? No, these are these those boats. Want to go back? Hard plastic. These are hard plastic. That's an ocean kayak. Sit um, on top. They sit on top. Thirteen top. foot sit on top. You want to sit on top in case you fall out. Because that occasionally happens. Because it's easier <laughs> right? to get back yeah. in. It's easier to get back in. Right? It's easier to get in now. When you're enclosed in there, also we swing our legs over the side, so we're in a chair, and then the boat's this way. Okay. You strip your line where your legs used to be. Now when you cast, it just goes right out. And it's easier on your back to sit this way than this way all day, right? And we have fins on our feet so we can maneuver the kayak. It's like a trolling motor. And when you hook the big one, you just kick your way away from the mangroves and hang on and let them in there. You might get sitting out there for over an hour without touching the paddle. Yeah. There are some days when we're using the current and we got it set up and everything's perfect, sometimes an hour without even touching the paddle. Do you use? Light, as light as possible, because then there's no weight pulling down on your leg. Because your legs, we put a seat cushion, you know, the life, life, they're um, kind of like a, they qualify as a life jacket, a throwable. Are they fins that you would use like for snorkeling? Float tubing. Okay. Float tubing. One, the snorkeling ones are probably too big. Force fins? Force fins are heavy. Force fins are great, well. but they're heavy. Yeah. The lightweight ones you can get uh, from Cabela's or whatever weigh absolutely nothing. And they don't put any strain on your leg. Because remember, the bottom of that kayak is sitting against your 
upper leg, mm -hmm. the back of your upper oh, leg, cut so off your circulation. Where did you get those? What? The light weekend, are they? Cut that one right down here. Mm -hmm. right. So those are great because they don't weigh much. And they're really easy to put in your suitcase. Remember, you got a pack to go there, and everybody's charging extra for luggage now, no matter where you go, which is kind of um, I'd like to apologize for that, but I don't know what they're going to do about that. But those are great, and they don't take up any room in your equipment bag either. But on the other hand, if I might interject, $25 for an extra bag or yeah. $50 for an overweight charge on a bag <coughs> is very small in comparison to the entire trip. Yeah. And you ought to take what the heck you want to take to go fishing. Absolutely. Good you point. So Good point. Everybody gets all worked up about the overweight charges or an extra bag charge. But really, it's just the price of going fishing. It's just a very small charge against a whole bunch of more stuff. Yep. Yeah. On Gary's trip, it's 1500 plus your airfare. And that's for a week of essentially, well, I, I can't say it was exactly guided fishing. Kind of takes you there, gives you some safety rules. Suggested so fishing. <laughs> yeah. So you're kind of on your own with that. If you need help with stuff, ask type of thing. But the extra bag, no. You want to have, you want to have your toys with you. And I mean, I had, I must have had three, three, three or four bags of stuff. Because yeah. I just didn't want to not have it. I want to have my toys and have my boat set up the way I wanted it set up. I mean, I rigged, it took me an hour to rig my kayak the way I wanted it, with the multiple rod holders, everything on there, so you set up. You took an anchor too, right? I had my regular anchor, which you know, was a folding anchor, and I had my sea anchor, drift sock, mm. had everything. Are there rod holders that clamp on the sides? Or no. Are you, are you <clears throat> the rod holders, I have a piece that goes on up front, it's just a foam piece yeah. uh -huh. that straps on around the hull, and it's got a big vinyl, hard vinyl, Plastic, you know, you use them for refrigerator tube, um, hard plastic drain pipe. Yeah, it's about, I want to say it's quarter to half inch, and it goes over the rope that ties it around. It gives me this big loop on top of a foam block. In the back, I've got attached to the kayak is a shock cord loop with a rope going around the transom coming to one on the other side. I can rack two rods, sticking a reel in through that loop, which cinches it down through that loop up front with the front of the rod and I've got two of them that are parallel to the deck so they're no hazard to casting. They're parallel to the deck. They're out of the way, no windage, no anything. And I've got one rod ready to go if I'm carrying three, which is you know, resting between my legs and sticking forward while I paddle. I mean, yeah, where I want to go, just deploy, drain line off and we're in business. But you, you can you tie everything off to the kayak where you want to have it go. I've got a trolley system that enables me to tie the anchors on, whether it's the drift sock or the actual anchor, and take that line to either end of the kayak. So it's anchored with the bow into the wind or to the current. And then everything else is downwind off my right shoulder because I'm right-handed. And there's not a lot less kayak behind me on my stern end. Right? So everything it never touches the kayak. It's real clean. Really clean setup. Is there a picture on fly flicker? Yes. There's a whole thing on step by step about how to set that up. And it's, I tell you, it's only a technique for setting it up. Some guys have the rod holders that they buy from Scott and put all that stuff together. I don't want anything sticking up in the air when I'm fly fishing. Because sometimes I'm taking it over my other shoulder, depending on the wind and where I happen to be at the time. If there's a fish breaking over there, I generally pick it up with two hands and get that line straight out on the water and then. I can cast this way, same as on my forehand. I've got the line coming this way over my head on the downwind side of me. Even though my rod hand is over here, the line's all here from this plane as I cast. Because my, my stripping basket, which is the whole kayak, is over here. So I get that line coming up out of that basket. So the next thing. What about transport? Transport? You've got to make your own arrangements to get there, unless you're part of the tour. You gotta fly down. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Well, I, I was talking about the kayak accident as well. You bring, throw them on your car and go? Yeah, nothing but a blanket and a couple of pieces of rope will get you there. It's real easy. Paddles are two piece. How oh, they fit in there? Lots of good fun. Having a buddy, somebody to help you unhook a fish. It was funny, these guys brought these soft baskets, which are no good in the surf, and then didn't bring a bogo over, and we're catching halibut. It's funny, after I brought this Canadian guy over and said, come on, go fish the surf with me, go fish the surf with me. He goes, 
Uh, Gary says it's no good. I said, just bring your rod. He had no idea how to do it anyways. Just bring your rod. No, it'll be fine. I'll just watch. And blah, blah, blah. Third cast. And <laughs> gave him a general tour of the holes and said, yeah, you fish these holes right here where it's darker water. And, oh, it's making sense. I said, let's work on this one first. <laughs> 10 pound halibut, and he's going, oh. I'm going to get my rod. I'm going to get my rod. And I said, Well, the penalty is you have to take the fish back to camp. So he had to march all the way across the dunes. Oh. And they actually get a picture of him coming back across the dunes holding this halibut over his shoulder. It's pretty funny. But it was amazing how fast he and Gary both showed up with their fly rod. <laughs> Different resources you have. These are tackles and charter guys. And you can get them from me. These two guys are really good here, and the Baja Big Fish. Pam is very good. She's in Loretto. Oh, Pam. Pam Bowles. And uh, they know a lot of the operation. She rents equipment, too. She'll rent you stuff. Not always cheap, but she'll, she'll work with you. She'll work with you, especially in a down year, which it has been. They didn't get near the Dorado they had the year before, which they loved the chase. And, uh, Jeff DeBrown is out of Real Baja, and he's knows a lot about that and the East Cape fishing too. He's been all he's been around the block a few times. Right. Different fly shops of course. You should be familiar with all those. And then getting there, over the airlines that still travel down there, different sources of maps, different sources of weather and information you need to plan your trip. It's the only these well, oh, sorry. Oh. Southwest goes to La Paz? Yep. Last I checked, <laughs> they could change this week. They were in and around somewhere. But. So just let, just find out what's going on. Magic seaweed and uh, temp break. I had a very good idea of what was going on temperature-wise and which species I'd be looking for in the estros. And I tied accordingly and dressed accordingly. And the, the waders were a guy. Everyone else fished generally three little sessions. And I just would leave the beach after breakfast and show up for after dark for dinner. Most of them had already been finished eating. I'd be still out fishing. It was warm enough. Warm is good. Right. Here's some different places and you might want to find some more information. Gary Graham's book is good, but it's you know very general, but it does give you some of the big picture. That's what that's actually where I started. And I went through a few of these others, but nobody has a lot of information on Magdalena Bay. There's a, a lot of people fishing it, I think, I, more than a few people, I should say, fishing it that know a lot about it that aren't saying anything about it. And the, the danger there is the pollution and the overfishing. These guys trying to make a living. And it's, it's hard to fault them for doing that when they're subsistence fishing. And uh, there's, there's got to be a balance in there somewhere. But it's, they say we've eaten 90% of the ocean's fish in the tuna department. And the evidence of that here we're seeing right now and that our bass counts are dropping off because the humble squid without anything to eat them, which used to be the tuna, are showing up and eating our bass. Our counts are so far down now in the last couple of years. And of course it goes in cycles, but we better start getting used to fishing for squid.